December 12th, if you would all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um. <laughs> and we will have an introduction of our members, and I would like to start with the person who is celebrating her birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy Lemieux, Blackstone member. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, Jenna Castellucho, Student Council President. Bethany Dunton, Blackstone member. Tara Larkin, Millville. Erin Vinaco, Millville. Jane Reggio, Millville. Jack Keefe, Blackstone. Karen Vernon, Millville. Sarah Williams, Blackstone. Danielle Catalano, Student Council Vice President. Matt Aaronworth, Assistant Superintendent. Jason DeFalco, Superintendent. Jenna? Um, the past couple of weeks have been very eventful for the school. Recently, before Thanksgiving break, we had our annual Powder Puff game. Um, the teams were seniors and freshmen versus sophomores and juniors. Uh, they played a tough game of flag po football. And in the end, the sophomores and juniors won the game. Um, the next very big thing coming up for the school is our annual tradition, pep rally. Um, that is happening the, day, the half day before Christmas break. And the theme of pep rally this year is movie genres. All the classes have to create a lip sync dance, uh, make the banner, and compete in games to win points for their class. All grades right now are getting prepared for um, that whether it's rehearsing the dance or painting the banner, everyone is getting really excited for the fun and festive time of Pep Rally. Um, there's always a spirit week, the week of Pep Rally, and this year um, on Monday is America Monday, Tuesday is Decades Day, Wednesday is Sports Day, Thursday is Ugly Sweater Day, and Friday is Class Colors Day. Student Council begins to prepare for Prep Rally far in advance and comes up with ideas for the games and figures out the spirit days and everything that needs to get done for Prep Rally. Mm -hmm. Winter sports have also started up. Um, girls and boys basketball has started as well as winter track. Some upcoming girls <coughs> home basketball games are tonight at 5.15, December 14th at 6.15, and December 27th at 1.45, and some upcoming boys home basketball games are December 17th at 6.15 and December 28th at 5.15. And we've gotten numerous volunteers from the National Honor Society as well as Student Council to help out at these home games with the 50-50 raffle and the scoreboard. And they show their support for the teams and the school. The band has started practices for their winter percussion and winds. Winter percussion and winds is um, it's new this year, so it's a great experience, and the band kids are having a lot of fun with it. Coming up for the band is a townwide holiday celebration at Roosevelt Field on Saturday, December 15th. A few kids are going down to the Blackstone Town Hall to play some Christmas music for families to sing along to and enjoy. Oh, cool. Some other brand programs that have started are jazz band and indoor color guard. Um, brass choir and woodwind choir is starting this week, which <coughs> the students are extremely excited for. And some upcoming concerts for the band are Monday the 17th, which is the high school concert band and wind ensemble and high school chorus, which starts at 7. The 7th and 8th grade band concert is December 19th, and the, which starts at 7, and the 6th grade band and 8th grade chorus concert is December 20th, and that starts at 7. The drama club is also in the, currently in the heart of their season. They are in a tech week, which is a week where they practice every single day after school, and they are performing a classic play, A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. And their performances are this Friday, the 14th, and this Saturday, the 15th. Um, Friday at 6.30 to 9, and Saturday it's 3.30 to 6. The Drama Club has been per, um, working hard to get this play together, and hopefully many people will come and enjoy this amazing play. Okay. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? What genre do the seniors have for their movies? Musicals. Oh, of course. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> Funny how that worked. Yeah. <coughs> Anybody have any questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll open it up now to public forum if anybody has anything they would like to <clears throat> address the school committee about. No? Okay. All right. Are they on the agenda? You're on the agenda. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, does anybody, do we need to separate out warrants and minutes for any reason? 
We missed the workshop, but this is all from before this the workshop. This is all from the yep. meeting. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to mm -hmm. approve the warrants and minutes of the November 12th meeting. So moved. Second. Second. <coughs> moved by Aaron, seconded by Jack. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. All right, so moved. Uh, school committee. There was something I was going to say. Now I don't remember <laughs> what it was. So we'll skip that. Uh, superintendent's report. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Reggio. Um, we are going to uh, open the superintendent report with uh, a small discussion um, with our, I believe, our president of our baseball uh, boosters program, uh, Ms. Carter and Ms. Warner. If you want to come on up and share with us uh, a little bit about what you're looking to do, that'd be great. And thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. You can have a seat. Our secretary, Geraldine Learning. Welcome. So we we are actually looking for approval from the school committee to purchase uniforms for the baseball team, for the JV team, so that the uniforms are the same as the varsity team. Right now, currently, the uniforms are about eight at least eight years old mm -hmm. so they're very outdated um, but we received a donation through a fundraiser for which they would like us to purchase equipment for the kids and they approved us purchasing uniforms if we can do so they would be the exact same uniforms through the exact same vendor they're approximately $72 each plus or minus shipping um, and they'll be numbered sequentially. So we're asking for approval <coughs> to purchase those. Okay. Is there any questions of this? I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. If I may just put a little background. So you may. I've been either the assistant coach or the head coach for forever since I started the schools in 2013 so I was the assistant coach and I took over last year as a head coach and we started the booster program and the jerseys that the JV students are using right now um, weren't even the varsity jerseys when I first started so in my opinion you, know, you want your child to go play for a sports team you want them to have something that makes them feel good about playing that sport and right now they're getting to JV and saying you're handing me this old piece of ripped cloth with stains and, and we're looking at them like, yeah, sorry, it's, it's what we have because it's the rotation we have. So in my mind, because of our school budget and booster clubs, having the willingness to donate these things, it, it's, it's a win-win for the kids, win-win for the school district. So that way, you know, the kids are happy. They feel like they're part of a community rather than just leftovers, per se. And, no, I just wanted to give you a little background in New Jersey so that, from my perspective, anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Yes. Do you know how many varsity uniforms we do have? 20. 20. So th this would bring a total of 30? Correct. And right. essentially and, and on a baseball teams. team, you really don't want more than 15 per mm -hmm. varsity and JV because then you have kids sitting there on the bench and not really participating. Yeah. So a total of 30 altogether. So it would be an additional 10. And potentially pants for everybody it would be the so. shirt right jersey with pants and numbered white right now they currently have one through 20 and we would have them number 20 to 30. 30 for the additional time and a lot of the kids will swing between teams too so then sure. they don't have to change yeah mm -hmm. and they have the same they don't look like they're easier. different I mean you know they're a team as they should be I believe every other sport has the same for JV and varsity as they're a whole yeah, I don't know. am I wrong on that I am I yeah. Yeah, some, the some are different, different. some are different. a little off them. Yeah. Okay. Well, this would be beneficial for when they are swinging, right. where they're not, yep. you know, in per right now they're purple, the varsity, and the older uniforms for are gray for the JV. Mm -hmm. So the, the JV are getting the brand new uniforms. The so JV, the, JV the JV would kids. get, yeah, the donation we would make would be to give the, the replace the JV. Oh. Varsities, you know, would go continue to go. They're fairly new. Yeah. As they do. Sorry. 
Well, <laughs> so the way that I've done tryouts is when we pick the teams is we lay the jerseys out and then oh, they can pick their number. Numbers. Yeah. So we would lay out one to thirty and you gotcha. know, go seniors, juniors, sophomores. Yeah. So it's not necessary that the, the JV is going to have the new jerseys. It's going to be kind of mixed in, so that way it's just one set of right. all of the same jerseys. Mm -hmm. for Which all. makes sense when yeah. the kid wants a number, they want their number, and if it's available, that makes sense. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, this is on our agenda, so if somebody would like to um, propose something, I, I will um, entertain that. Motion to accept the donation of 10 uniforms from the Chargers Baseball Booster Club. Is there a second? Second. A second. By it? Lots of them. Lots of them. <laughs> Pick one. Uh, is there any further discussion? I just want to say thank you for the Booster yeah, Club for doing that. Thank you for it having us. Great. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you to Chris for stepping up and asking for it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the donations, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Abstentions. Well, thank you for your time, and thank we look you. forward to seeing new thank fancy you. uniforms. We look forward to doing more. Yeah, yeah. that'd be thank great. You. Thank you. Yeah, the gray ones are yeah. gray ones don't look good. Sliding into bases. <laughs> Um, the next item on our agenda is to go over, um, uh, before we get to our guest, uh, just briefly uh, share with the school committee our 30-hour uh, trip to San Francisco and back. <laughs> 13 of the 30 hours were on a plane. Poor uh, Ms. Kurt had to sit between Mr. Dudek and I, oh so my. I feel badly for this. But you got okay. the middle seat. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, but... Um, we did have an opportunity, as you know, to go out and visit uh, a high school in San Francisco, uh, just outside of San Francisco, that is using the Summit Learning Platform. Um, and uh, it was remarkable. Uh, actually, interestingly enough, the high school is about the same size as ours, so 450 kids. And um, it was just so powerful to be able to be present uh, on Monday with educators from literally coast to coast. Mm. Uh, we were the only ones from Massachusetts, so, you know, go BMR yeah. in terms of really looking at um, what I would consider a real cutting-edge way to really accelerate uh, and engage both uh, teachers and students in the, in the teaching and learning process. But um, to really have a chance to kind of delve into what this platform looks like and how it's really helping to assist in transforming the classroom learning experience for our, our youth and having discussions with the instructional director from Chicago Public Schools, you know, third mm. largest district in the country, to conversations with the assistant superintendent from a 700 student district in Kentucky. Mm. Um, and, you know, truly everything, uh, literally everything in between in terms of how districts are really uh, utilizing this platform to help engage students in a much uh, more meaningful and deep way of learning and applying their learning. So I know for the three of us, uh, it, was a, it was a remarkable experience. Uh, it's going to probably take me a week to catch up, but that's okay. Uh, but uh, Donna Stone is here uh, this evening from the Summit Base Camp, um, which is a, a professional development and implementation support um, group from Rhode Island to talk and share with the committee uh, her expertise, which is, uh, is, which is significant, uh, about the, the platform itself and how schools are using it uh, to really help transform teaching and learning uh, for, for kids. So, uh, Donna, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, Will this mouse run the PowerPoint? It's uh, that or the keyboard. One of the, oh, Jesse can help with that. <laughs> there you go. for 20 years I am not sure I need a microphone <laughs> you you don't need it for us you need it for the people on the television yeah no so pressure. Thank you. Um, again my name is Donna Stone and I am the executive director of New England Base Camp we are a educational nonprofit uh, that supports teachers and school leaders through change and a little bit about our background is um, I came to to explore summit about four years ago at the time, I was working district level in Pawtucket, one of Rhode Island's larger uh, school districts, and I went on an exploration to see this summit public schools. 
and we were a host of uh, seven t uh, teachers, school leaders. We had uh, philanthropic people on and charter people and district people. And as we traveled through the, the schools, we were out there for about four or five days. Um, at one point or another, every single one of us cried mm -hmm. because we were seeing in the classroom what we all came into education for in the first place. We saw teachers um, that were talking about the work that they were doing and, what, and how they were shifting the paradigm of teaching and learning in their classrooms. We talked to students who could tell us what they were learning, why they were learning it, and how they were going to apply those skills. They were also brutally honest and told us that it was really hard and they didn't really like it for a long time. <laughs> Which I can completely understand when you're talking to students and asking them to change the way that they learn and have some ownership. So that was about the time that Summit Public Schools was thinking about giving away their model of, of instruction and the platform of curriculum for free. And so we all jumped on the plane to return back to Rhode Island and a few of us started writing the application out right there and then. And I wanted to bring it to Pawtucket. And so I went to the superintendent and she said, if you can make it work in our alternate placement program, then you can make it work anywhere. And so 200 uh, schools applied to be part of so, uh, Summit's Cohort 1. 19 schools in the country got in. Three of them happened to be in Rhode Island. We had the Pawtucket uh, Learning Academy, an alternate placement school mm -hmm. for students who were struggling in, in our traditional district, uh, traditional schools. We had Pleasant View Elementary School in Providence, our largest urban district, 41% special ed and they were going to create their own curriculum because at the time Summit only had curriculum 6 through 12. And then Blackstone Valley Prep uh, High School, which is a, a charter school in Cumberland, and it is a um, nationally recognized high school. Those are three very diverse schools, as you can imagine, and uh, we were very excited to do the work. And I had a thought that if we were going to do this work together, uh, if we were going to do this work and all be implementing the same model, shouldn't we do it together? And um, I was lucky enough to have met a funder who said, I believe in you and I'm going to pay your salary if you leave Pawtucket to coach these three schools. How often do you meet somebody who's going to pay your salary? <laughs> Not too often. Uh, my husband thought it was a midlife crisis and <laughs> wanted me to buy a sports car instead of leaving my pension <laughs> behind, but I decided to leave my pension behind and give this a try. So that first year, I supported um, teachers in the classroom, worked with students, worked with school leaders, created PD based on the trends that I was seeing in the classrooms, and um, got really excited about what we were seeing. First of all, I was able to take traditional schools and district schools together and have them learn from and with each other, which was pretty exciting for me. And we started to bring teachers and school leaders into these <coughs> schools. Now, BVP was used to having people walk through their schools, but no one had ever come to the PLA. Mm -hmm. No one had ever come to see what was happening, this dynamic, amazing educational environment that was happening in that school. And we would go through PVE, uh, Pleasant View Elementary. So people started getting excited about it, and they wanted to learn more. And so that very next year, we had 13 schools that wanted to do this work. And so we knew we were on to something, and that the, we would be able to learn from and with each other. From there, we have uh, now, in our fourth year, have 28 schools that we support that are doing this um, implementation of the model, and we have another 10 schools that we support outside of the model. All of our work is around these three uh, C's of, of our work. So we coach uh, teachers in the classroom. We make sure that we are opening classroom doors, having them <coughs> share their experiences, and helping to build their practice. I was a teacher for a very long time, and I sat through a lot of professional development, walk in walked into my classroom, closed my door, and did what I thought was best. And this, um, this embedded coaching system that we have opens that door all the time and we make sure that teachers are seeing other teachers in their district and across the state, learning, um, seeing what they're doing and learning from them. We bring teachers together from across the region 
so that they can learn from and with each other. We look at our trends that we're seeing across our classrooms and we create professional development and we invite teachers to join us to um, better their craft. And we build capacity because the one thing I don't want to do is have school districts still be relying on New England Base Camp five, six, seven years from now. We want to be able to build capacity in our districts so that this will actually be something that sticks. And that, so we do a coach the coach model and we bring uh, teacher leaders in to learn exactly the way that we coach so that we can release districts to do this work on their own. So why am I here um, as New England Base Camp to talk to you about Summit Learning? So we are a partner of Summit Learning. Way back when this first started, knowing that there had to be a, a layer of support between Summit and what was happening in the classroom was important to us, uh, important enough to actually create this program, and we continue to do that work. So Summit Learning is a free platform and, mo and model. Every single Summit school comes with a mentor, so you have someone from the Summit Public Schools who is going to mentor your school leaders. They're going to talk about data. They're going to help train you. But they don't go down into this classroom level, and that's where we come in. So we support teachers right there in the classroom. Of the schools that are uh, now implementing the Summit model, you can see we have 50% are free and reduced. We have about 15% that are English language learners, and we have 15% that are special education students. For our schools that we support, those numbers are just a little higher. We have about 75% free and reduced lunch, 17% special ed, and 17% L. No. This is why I believe in Summit. So they have a 100% graduation rate. 100% of their students graduate with the skills that they need to be accepted into a four-year college in uh, California. Of those 100% of the students, 90% actually get into four-year colleges and the other 2% get into two-year colleges or a trade. And 55% of their students graduate from college within uh, six years. And the first time I saw that number, I was thinking, that's not good enough. And they feel the same way, but it is actually double the national average. But that's a number that they want to see increase. Here are the student outcomes around this model. This is, this is what we want students to get from this. They get the cognitive skills. These are those skills that you need, that I need, to be successful in our jobs and in our daily life. They get the content knowledge, that content and skills that they need in their algebra class and in their science classes, along with the habits of success. The habits of success um, are all of those skills that help students to keep going. So we're talking about perseverance and growth mindset and the ability to strategy shift when things aren't working. You know, a lot, a lot of our classrooms have like a sit and get model and we really work with students to be able to be the owners of their learning. That doesn't mean that the teacher isn't still an important part of the classroom because there is no learning without the teacher. But we want to be able to build the students' capacity to be able to do this work when they leave our classrooms. So you think about students who go into college and if they don't have the skills that they need to be that self-directed learner, they fail and they drop out. I was one of those hover moms who would go on and tell my son that he had a report due or that he had a test on Friday and then I sent him off to college in the hopes that he was going to figure that out on his own. He did, by the way. <laughs> I can be kind of scary, so um, he, he's doing quite well. But you do worry about that. And so being able to build those skills with students is important. The entire instructional model has three pillars. Mentoring, which I feel is the most important part. Every single teacher mentors students one-on-one -on -one for 10 minutes a week. We start with this because connected students are students that learn. Students who feel that they have, you know, at least one adult in their school who knows and understands them are going to come to school. 
they're going to be able to say that they are connected to their classroom in the school community. If I had my, my wish, every school in our region would be doing <coughs> mentoring, if anything else. Then we have um, self-directed learning. So this is an opportunity where students engage with the computer, with the online curriculum, to get the content and the skills that they need to be successful in their project time. This is where students work on being self-directed learners. They have to have a plan. They have to, to make a goal. They have to learn, show that they've, they've acquired those skills, and then they have to reflect on their learning. What worked, what didn't work, and what would you do differently? And then they take that content and skills, and they go over to their project time. Now their project time is their science class, their history class, their English class, and their math class. And that's where they're going to apply those skills. So the teacher isn't standing at the, t at the front of the room telling the students about the battles and the dates and, and, and um, such. They are actually asking students to apply the skills that they've learned to be able to have a Socratic seminar and discuss why those battles and generals affect us today. Like, what happened during that war that is still impacting us today? And it's an amazing shift for teachers. Now, they still get to do all the teaching, but now they're going to do a mini lesson about a content or skill that they want <laughs> students to know, and then they're going to be able to release students to be able to apply those skills. And while students are doing that, the teacher can now take small group and, and <coughs> do some targeted <clears throat> instruction. So rather than the way I instructed when I was in the classroom, I shot for the middle and hoped for the best on either side, the teachers are now able to really meet students where they are. So if we have five students that are struggling with a particular concept or skill, she can now take those students into small group while the other students are applying their skills. It is a very powerful thing to see in the classroom. But it is a shift in that paradigm of teaching and learning. And it's, and it's a shift that we have to coach teachers to actually en engage with and embrace. <coughs> Once they do, there's no stopping them. So this is what it looks like. I don't want to go, I'll go very quickly at this point. This is what it looks like for mentoring. Um, there's an actual aspect of the platform where students prep for their conversation with their teacher. So they go in and they put in some, they answer some questions, they put in things that they want to talk about with the teacher. The teacher's going to have that information and she's going to sit and do a one on one with that student and be able to put notes in. So they can talk about their goals for today, their goals for the week. They can talk about how the student's practicing to do, do 100 free throws by the summer. The idea is, is that it's a time to really connect with the student and have those little notes in there so that the teacher can really get to know the student and the student can reflect and look back on their progress throughout the year. These are the habits of success that I was talking about, the way that we want students to engage in that mindset for themselves um, as students. This is the cognitive skills. So in our project time, when they're <coughs> applying those, the content and skills that they got during SDL, they are graded on a cognitive skills rubric. Let's get rid of that. Here are all the skills that we want students to acquire. So we know in, in, in self-directed learning time that they understand the content and the skills. And now we want them to apply them. And this is how they are, are scored. They are scored on, all, there's 36 of these skills. They don't come up in every single project. But these skills are uh, graded from sixth grade to 12th grade, the expectation of where they land on those, uh, on the rubric goes up with every grade level. So it would look something like, oops, doesn't want to show me. There are grade spans for every single grade. Now that doesn't mean if you have a fourth grader that they can't score a seven, because they can, but we have a scoring range of expected skill levels for fourth grade, fifth grade, and so on. So you can see here it's the same concept with higher expectations for a tenth grade, obviously, than a fourth grade. So 
your cognitive skills get uh, <coughs> graded. 70% of your grade, the student's grade, comes from the project. It comes from applying those skills. 30% of the grade comes from that content, that self-directed learning time when they're working on the computer and gaining those content and skills. And the habits of success are not graded, but those are the skills that are going to um, really impact students down the road. No one's going to ever ask it what you got in ninth grade history, but they'll know if you have the skills to be a, a successful employee down the road. That was the fastest I've ever presented. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next steps, um, I'm going to answer your questions. Um, so the next steps for Blackstone um, Nova Regional would be to engage in the application process if they so please. That gets their their name out there to Summit so that Summit knows that they're interested. It does, you can start that path and, and, and change, but it's a good thing to get the application started so you know what to expect. It's really engaging with the teachers. The weight of this change is on the teacher's shoulders. I will not fool you in telling you otherwise. There is no magic wand here. Um, this is an overnight switch. But I can tell you I work with you know, 300 teachers who will say this is the hardest work they've ever done, but it's the best work they've ever done. And um, it's like following the evolution of a first year teacher. In September, first day of school, they are so excited mm -hmm. to do this work. And somewhere about uh, the end of September, early October, when they realize what a shift this is, I'm not the most popular person around. <laughs> um, and it's great at this time of the year because we start to see the light going yeah. on and yeah. start to see students doing the work. And by February, and this is in every school that we were in so far, by February, teachers say I could never teach any other way again. And that's when I remind them about how much they didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> and so we really would like to do some uh, work with the teachers. Just give them an overview of the model. That's more than 10 minutes, and uh, let them actually see it in action. It's happening in districts all around us. And then the next most important part is community engagement. You really want to make sure that your teachers and your, your parents um, have a clear understanding of what this looks like. And that includes your students, too, because the shift for them is going to be big as well. Whew, OK. Nice work. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? The results that you talked about in terms of 100% eligible to apply for four-year college, 98% accepted to at least one mm -hmm. four-year college, is that true for New England, Rhode Island? So this is our fourth year, so we haven't quite got there yet. We have had a couple of graduating classes, which I'm very uh, happy about. Some of the, the um, results that we're seeing so far is around um, student achievement on like star testing, seeing them grow from mm -hmm. September to June in greater proportions than students not doing this work. Um, a decrease in behavior referrals because kids who are engaged and kids who are connected are, are going to behave. Um, you know the student that's struggling or the student who's bored because they're waiting for the rest of the class to catch up are going to find other things to do. Mm -hmm. And there is no I'm done in this work. So students can go deeper into a subject area if something really excites them. They can go further along in the coursework for the year or, or they can take it outside and, and expand on their projects. So we don't see a lot of... Um, boredom after the first month the first month they have to learn all the the ways to do it um, we started thinking that they just became self-directed <laughs> learners um, and they don't and so we spend the first month of school really teaching them what it means to be a self-directed learner to set those goals make a plan learn show it and then reflect on it that's very different for students so we have to teach them how to take notes and things like that um, but we also see um, an in a decrease in absenteeism, not only for our students, but for our teachers, too, which I think oh, is great. Because teachers good. who feel like they're making a difference show up. And so that's exciting as well. And the mentor does not have to be their classroom teacher. Right. So I have uh, schools where the principal engages in the mentoring. 
You think about every adult in your school should be contributing to the education of students. I always thought it'd be great if we had bus drivers and secretaries take 15 minutes to read to kids because they need to know that other, other people read, not just the teacher in the room. Um, so it's, it's not. So we try to keep the mentor groups about 15 or so. So that's where we can engage other people in the, in the work. And we train them to do that as well. So is the bulk of this compu computer based? So it's not. Um, I get very uh, dismayed if I walk into a project time classroom and I see a lot of computers open. I mean, it is their notebook, it is their math book and their science book, so there's an expectation that they're going to engage in the computers. But during SDL time, when they're getting that content and skills, they are engaging with the computer. And you're going to see students sitting with their computers open with their notebooks next to them. You're also going to see a teacher pulling students together for small group instruction. If she sees that they're struggling on note taking, she'll pull them together and do a little mini lesson on note taking, or how do you create a study guide, or how do you make uh, flashcards. And then when you go into project time, your traditional math class, science class, you should see um, more people time is what we call it. And so we work with teachers to kind of make sure that students aren't all stuck with their computers in front of them. This should be time when you're seeing small groups working together, couples working together. But there's also that choice. If there are students that prefer to work alone, and we've seen students just absolutely fly because they get the opportunity to work alone, then that's allowed as well. There's where the choice lives. And the, the curriculum? So the curriculum, does that align with like Common Core or state standards or like what does the curriculum look like? Mm -hmm. Yep, so the curriculum is all created by teachers for teachers. It's all Common Core aligned. It is highly vetted and extremely rigorous, but every single piece of the curriculum is modifiable. So this is an opportunity for a, um, a teacher who, and we hear this all the time, I have a ninth grader who reads on a sixth grade level. How am I going to give him access to the curriculum? And s teachers can go into the platform and they can make modifications. If they're doing World War II, the teacher can find text at a sixth grade level and she can push it out to that student or five students or all the students. There's no red uh, alarm going off that the kid has a book that's at a lower grade, uh, lower reading level, mm -hmm. which I love. It evens the, the playing field. If I have a student that needs a word bank, I can put that into the checkpoints and push that out to as many students as I need. Um, if I have a student who needs to do a five paragraph essay instead of a three paragraph essay because they need to be challenged, then you can do that as well. There's so much power in being able to modify the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And this is the, a great opportunity for special education teachers and uh, traditional teachers to work together because it's completely transparent. Everything I do on the platform as, as a teacher can be seen by any other teacher in my school. And that way, when you're doing SDL, when the students are working on the computer, mm -hmm. you might not know the answer to the math, but you can, you can see where the math teacher is going with it. You can and help in that way. And parents can see it all as well. So when, I, when my son was in school, and he would just love that I keep talking about him, mm -hmm. when there's a camera on, that's even worse. Mm -hmm. um, if he got a 70, I'd say, How, you know, why did you get a 70? And he said, the teacher gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, that doesn't work. I am a teacher. I said, How did you earn that 70? And it, you, he really couldn't tell me. And now parents can log on, and not only can they see the grade, but they can see every step of the project and the feedback that the teacher gave to the student. So it's a lot easier to say, well, you got that 70 because the teacher asked you to do this, this, and this, and you didn't, didn't do, do it. it. So it's a rubric. The rubric is right there. The rubric is right there. It lives right there. And all of the materials that the teachers are modifying, they can save everything and use it next year. Mm -hmm. So the first year is like their workhorse year where they're really it's the, nut, the nuts changes. and bolts mm -hmm. yep it's the nuts and bolts and I always say like the second year they actually um, now have the model under their belt and now they're really going to work with tweaking the curriculum and how does it work with specials like say the art teacher music teacher are they
part of this, or have you seen them be part of this phys ed uh, reading? Yep, so we have schools where um, te uh, health teachers and art teachers have created their own coursework and actually uploaded it to the platform so students can engage in it there as well. We have uh, schools where um, those teachers help to do the um, mentoring, which is a great part of it. So right now on the, on the platform we have our four core subjects in Spanish, but we have plenty of, of schools that create their own um, coursework right in there as well. Anyone else? Can you use what other schools have created? Yeah. Is there a share like feature? So that's what teachers always ask like, well, if I if I work really hard to create this, does everybody get it? And they don't. But all you have to do is take the web link at the top of the page mm -hmm. on the website, and you can share that with anyone. And as they when they click on that link, they get a view only version of it, and then they can say, I want to adopt this into my platform and they can just click on it and bring it in and then they can make all of their own modifications and we have a strong sense of collaboration so if a teacher asks me for a particular you know I want to do a project on the book holes then we just bang it out and, and ask people across the country does anyone have a project on holes and then they pop up and people share them mm -hmm. which if we had done that in yeah. the last 50 years, right? If we could have yeah. just yeah. been able to share the best practices of the, right. of the best teachers across the board, yeah. can you imagine where we'd be right now? That'd be awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'd invite you to come um, on a learning tour. I'll share the information with Jason. Um, it would be great uh, for you to come into a classroom and actually see it and speak with uh, the students and the teachers what we do on our learning tour is we start with an overview of the model and then we go in and uh, observe classrooms and then we have lunch with the students. They bring their computers mm -hmm. and they, while they're munching on pizza, they talk about, they show you the platform, they talk about the work. We, only, we ask them to be honest but respectful and boy are they honest, mm -hmm. so you'll hear it all. And then we wrap up the day with a teacher panel, so you can really t ask teachers questions about the shift in their in their practices and what does it take to do it successfully. So it's a it's a very honest way to spend a day, and you get to go on a yellow school bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody takes pictures on the yellow school bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you all very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So thank you. And if I could say, I haven't gone on a learning tour, I, I think. Um, one of the most powerful things is actually speaking with, with the, the students. students because they, they'll, they'll really, and they're, they are brutally honest about, you know, it, usually what I have heard them say is at first I hated this because I had to do this, like I had to do school really different. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to like learn again. And so, uh, but then once they get past that and they get into their actual platform and they start going through their assignments it's really remarkable. I watched two young ladies, um, I may have shared this example before, but it was really, uh, it was really incredible, uh, looking at a battle, a particular battle in the Civil War, and uh, they were across the room from each other, and uh, one was writing, they both had to read a piece of text from um, the North and the South, and then they had to write from the perspective of that particular soldier. And one of the uh, young ladies even actually wrote and spelled incorrectly because that was how mm -hmm. the uh, soldier did. And just watching the two of them go back and forth was unbelievable, writing from, and that was, um, I think it was a seventh grade social studies class. And, that's and we don't bring in ringers. We, we ask them <laughs> yeah, to take them amazing. randomly. So sometimes you'll get a student who is struggling and you can see it, yeah. but we need to see all perspectives. We certainly don't want you all thinking it's easy because it's not, but um, it is something to see. We've got another I question. Sure. question. Sorry. Um, what, what grade level do you see this works best being implemented at? <coughs> so I love sixth grade because sixth grade, they're old enough to understand the change, but young enough to make the change easier. Right? So I love, I love to see sixth graders do this work. Um, but we've had great success with ninth graders who are looking for a change. They are, 
they're technology natives, they <coughs> understand and can work through using a uh, computer as a tool, and so they adapt quicker in that sense of, mm -hmm. of the work. Mm -hmm. I actually have one other quick question, Donna, mm -hmm. just briefly. Um, how is this different than like virtual high school? Are you, are you familiar with virtual high school mm -hmm. and how? Absolutely. It's, it's the teacher. Yeah. It's, the teacher is still such an important part of this work. We couldn't do this without them. Um, the students don't, are not isolated. I shouldn't ever walk into a class and not hear anything. Um, and, the, and the teacher is still, the, te the teacher is the holder of the content. They know what students need to know and the, the best ways to make sure that students get that knowledge. So we praise our teachers. We're just asking them to just <coughs> shift a bit in their instruction. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your night. Um, just so you guys know, Aaron and I had a chance to play with the platform a little bit and look into some of the classes, and it's it's kind of cool. I mean, there's a lot of information out there. Is there another learning tour coming up? Yeah, there is another learning tour in January, February, so February. I have it's about every calendar. six weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Have it yeah, we can get the dates out to folks. Right. Okay. Yeah, Erin, I think you registered for it already, right? Yeah. Or you marked it here. <laughs> and if it's hard for you to take an entire day from your work day, mm -hmm. as I can imagine, we can set up a private shorter tour um, at some of our local schools around here, so you get at least an opportunity to see it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, February seventh. So, sorry. Okay. It's a Thursday. So um, shifting gears a little bit, actually still on um, at least the, the technology um, topic, um, we have a couple of quick things to review regarding the middle school. Uh, first, um, you have in your packet some proposed technology changes to the middle school handbook that need to be made. Um, because as everyone is aware, um, and thankfully to the committee for uh, restoring the one-to-one uh, -one devices from the budget, um, our uh, technology is being rolled out, actually, uh, and Ms. Kurt has an update for us on that uh, in just a moment. Uh, but we do need the uh, committee to approve a couple of changes to the handbook. Um, what we did was essentially uh, utilize the same language from the high school handbook, um, mm -hmm. but we did have to make two small adjustments. Um, Underneath the add to page 11 after cell phone section, you'll see at the very bottom there, there's malicious and unlawful use of school computers, that last kind of clause. Mm -hmm. Third offense um, says suspension. The high school uh, handbook has suspension and expulsion. So we're going to actually ask the committee for a little bit of a twofer here. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to take expulsion out uh, under um, the Massachusetts general laws. Expulsion is not legal. Mm -hmm. We do not expel children from public schools. Um, under Chapter 222. So uh, we do need to, we're going to ask the committee to approve the new language for the middle school, but also to approve us removing the expulsion uh, so that our handbook at the high school can be aligned uh, with the state uh, laws. Um, and then on the second page, it is a small piece uh, as well. It's a, about the uh, halfway down the page. Um, the paragraph starts with internet use is governed by uh, the school committee. Um, you will see the uh, second to last sentence from time to time, the network and integration administrator. Uh, that title is listed there. Uh, that is the language we should have. The uh, high school language has director of technology, of which we do not have. Um, so we just want to make sure that we make the um, correction in the high school handbook as well. Small things, but we just want everyone okay. to align. Any questions about this yes yeah, let's go ahead. Um, I uh, were you able to kind of get a um, when we talked I was um, wondering if we could add language <coughs> into this policy to address the timeline for teachers assigning homework um, that was a concern of some high school parents last year it never got into the high school handbook but um, some of the the, you know the potential issue there is that a teacher the student leaves class at two o'clock 
the, ho the teacher then puts homework due for tomorrow at 8 p.m. Student is not on yeah. um, the computer, so, and then they're held somehow held responsible. Um, so I was just wondering if we could add something in there. Oh, I don't and know. And if why I may I'm speak to that, when I was senior in high school, I sought to add something to the handbook along those lines, and had multiple meetings with high school administration that promises were made and not kept. So it's that was a big issue for me my first year here, and it's definitely something that needs to be addressed because it does happen. So I and I appreciated the feedback um, on that, and so one of the thoughts I had regarding next steps there would be to address the homework policy as a whole. Um, to create essentially a structure from which we all can function and that um, this particular piece could be included in a homework policy which would then get translated into homework procedures and practices across the schools. Uh, we do have a policy subcommittee now which is great um, so I thought this is something that could be taken up in the policy subcommittee to look at the overall structure um, and then really give it a thorough revision to make sure it's what we want from a policy perspective and then we can enact the change through the procedures from there. I don't know if there are any thoughts or slow thoughts, but yes. Um, so I mean do you think that the pol that it it's appropriate at the policy level seeing as though there's such a potentially a great difference in the expectations for homework at the elementary level versus the middle school level and the high school level. Or I do. I, I, I guess that's my question. But but no, no teacher, regardless of the level of grade, should be assigning a homework assignment at 8 p.m. at night, right. regardless right. of They the should level. be giving homework so, during the class correct, period. Correct, during the class if period. When you leave the class, yeah. if that homework hasn't been assigned, exactly. regardless of the <laughs> class, regardless of the age, regardless of the class, so I don't know. I, I don't know enough about what our policy says now, or um, so and I, it shouldn't be like you'll have homework. Go on, look and for it. Look right for, at five o'clock, right. homework appears. Specific. That should not be happening at all. And so I think through a policy, what we could do is set those provisions. Okay. Um, and uh, but I have seen policies uh, for this particular issue where it does look at grade spans. So it will. What I've what I've seen. Um, um, in other places is it will look at uh, content area in minutes so you know K to 2 you would have that is what we have yeah. it, it's in the handbook so is that a policy or a procedure so I don't know if it lives in our policy manual if it does not live in our policy manual and it's just in the handbook then it is a procedure um, however as a committee we could create a policy around this that would then drive what we would have in our handbook Right, because the procedures and practices need to live and function within our policies. Based off the policies, correct. So we could certainly set that, those set of expectations at the policy level and then And then the handbook has no option but to reflect can, the policy. Can principals yeah. address that? Yes. In the meantime, because it is, live, it is happening live. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, and I'm not even aware of that. I just know that that was a conversation that we had last year. Get homework at 11 o'clock at night on a yes. Saturday. It riles you up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Absolutely. So we'll table that basically. And so, uh, so would the, we could send it to the subcommittee on the policy <coughs> subcommittee? We can. Okay. Great. <laughs> Get that done, will you? Make yourself a note oh, to work yeah. on that. <laughs> <laughs> the two that we're just speaking. Uh, okay. So we, we can address that separately. We do need to address this. So we have in front of us proposed changes to, I would say, student handbooks and essentially uh, whether it's the high school or the middle school make the appropriate changes as written our motion to accept to the middle school and mirror it to the high school just those little those two are yeah. me me matching each other that's correct? Yeah, that's a really so we're accepting this one and we want to mirror the high school to this one yeah, no, this to the high school. Well, this does. This mirrors to the high yeah, school, but the have to remove, the, have to remove to expulsion spots. and the name of the. Person. So what we accept here would be good for high school as well. That's the way I. So yeah. I, th what I did in my notes was I said proposed technology changes to crossed out HMS and wrote student handbooks with an S. So essentially. Whatever we adopt here will be mir mirrored in any handbook that has a cell phone or technology portion in their handbook. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming the page numbers aren't going to line up, though, so we just have to. 
Right. It, within the Between two handles? Between the two. I mean, I, 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 that would be amazing if it did, but. Yeah, just make it all. I don't know what the elementary hand looks like. No, no, but Can we do two different same. motions? One to accept Can? this for middle school and then the two little. To amend the high schools? Two little nuggets. We can. So I'll make a motion to accept the proposed technology changes to the HMS student handbook as written. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. So I'll entertain another motion. I make the motion <laughs> to change the language in the high school handbook to remove expulsion. the word expulsion under the misuse of Chromebook and also um, to change the title of the person um, making determinations on whether specific uses of the network are consistent with the acceptable use practice to network and integration administrator. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. So. Um, and um, Ms. Burke, if you want to join us just for a moment, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Chromebook uh, rollout at the middle school. Very exciting time for our students and staff here. So thanks for being here, Ms. Kirk, to talk the committee through uh, a little bit about how we're doing that and how we're going to utilize those tools to really improve teaching and learning. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Um, so the, the, we rolled out today. Um, just to quickly share, we actually rolled out 375 Chromebooks to students. Um, we just have 32 left that need to sign up. And um, some of them may not have gone due to some student absences today. Um, but that, could, that went very well. We, I mean, at one point, we had to do 78 students in one period. Um, but we made it. And we were able to distribute it to all of the students. What, and then we also made use of them right away. So. We looked at a way to help those Chromebooks to, to have students and notifying the teacher as well as their counselors and communicating. So if they're missing an assignment, a homework, or something, we helped them learn how to set up email accounts with everyone they needed in there. And, and Google doesn't do um, contact groups anymore. They just labels. Um, so we've already taught students how to do that today. That's what we spent part of the time when they got their Chromebook and also explaining the expectations that you had in front of you um, of how to use it, that it's a learning device and it's not something that's a toy um, or something that's not to be used for learning and that it is a school-owned device. Um, so for, and for parents, uh, during the parent-teacher conferences, we, Mr. Bozan and myself rolled every 20 minutes presentation uh, to let parents know what was coming, what, the Chrome, what a Chromebook is, what G Suite is because maybe the students know what Google is and, and Drive and all that, but the parents don't really know. Um, and then the biggest thing that we're using is really for the teachers. So I've actually been working on the whole plan of how we're going to roll this all out with Mr. Dudek at the high school and how they did it, um, the supports that they have in place, where the students go, so that what our procedures are, if a student needs a loaner, if something happened to it, that they're doing the same procedures here as at the high school so that it's something that they're used to and it's not new. Um, so for the teachers, we're doing a PD session, so we're using a lot of upcoming PD days or faculty meetings, but I also created um, with Mrs. Tasker and Mr. Dudek is all, we're also going to open it up to the high school because we don't know even what Mr. Dudek, like a lot of training that teachers have had at the high school. And so we actually have a PD sessions that are going to start from January and go all the way to the end of May. Um, and we put them on Mondays, on the opposite Mondays where the teachers already have meetings since it's a day that they're used to. So they will have seven and a half hours of PD training and then they'll have an hour and a half time where they're going to create a lesson with the integration of technology that they have learned and submit that in order to get 
professional development credits, uh, they call PDPs, because you need, you need at least 10 of them to get any kind of credit for anything. So in January, our main focus will be uh, Google Classroom and how to use that. We currently have about half the teachers using it, but Google had, over this past summer, a huge change. So even the ones who are very comfortable, there's a lot of new things to learn in Google Classroom. In February, our focus is going to be on G Suite, which is all of the things that are in Google, which is forms, slides, documents, Keep, which not a lot of people use. I don't know a whole lot about it, so I know it's helpful, um, but just some way that they can use it. And then Calendar. Um, eventually, I would like to be as paperless as possible. Um, I try to be as paperless as possible and not a lot of paper coming out of the principal's office. And like with calendar, I don't see a use for an agenda. If everything's on the calendar, students have things on the calendar, you can make reminders, you can make to-do lists in Keep, and they could have everything they need in that book, in the Chromebook. Um, in March, uh, last week, Mr. Bose and myself, and actually Mr. Pilling, who was here earlier, we sat in on a webinar with um, someone in Los Angeles. We didn't have to fly there. I didn't have to fly there <laughs> this time. <laughs> um, so she actually was talking about the Go Guardian teacher that came with the devices and how that would work. So we are going to explain and show some of the Go Guardian teacher features in January because I don't want to wait till March. Um, but she's going to get even more in depth on how that is. So um, from some ex one example she gave with Go Guardian. We, I will make sure that the teachers have Google Classroom set up because if you have all your students in one classroom, it wouldn't work. But when they're in your class in Google Classroom and you want them to look at these three websites, you can say that in GoGuardian so the students are on task and on those three sites and are not looking somewhere else. Um, then in March also, so that will be part of it, but then the last of it is really when can the students or when to, can the teachers integrate technology that's optimum time and is going to be the best for teaching and learning in the lesson opening section and in April it will be during the middle section of the of the period the lesson the engagement part websites that can be used and then in May focusing on the <coughs> part of a lesson and so we're going to look at add-ons extensions websites to use to integrate and when to integrate. So creating a personalized or blended learning really has to do with not just using <coughs> technology, but finding the best one to use and giving, letting students know numerous ones so that they can have a choice in what they're using. Um, one other thing we did roll out too was um, explain to the students today and the teachers, so a teacher, you know, so they know right away when they walk in expectations for Chromebook use. We gave out traffic lights. One of the teachers said that her school mm. used it. We thought it was very, very helpful. So that this traffic light would say, you know, you don't need your Chromebook today. We're going to be doing something else. Um, the yellow one would mean get it ready, sign in, leave it at a 45 degree angle, not using it right away, but at some point during the class period, we're going to use it and green is we're going to be using it right away so they know to take it out, log in, and be ready for class. And uh, Ms. Kurt, what I, I appreciate about your overview is you're looking at some of the logistics of kind of, you know, uh, the actual hardware and managing the, the devices, the teacher training, the student training, some of the work you've done with the families around how to actually use it <coughs> and how we're going to be using them, and then some of the systems and structures you're putting in place to actually you know, integrate them into the lessons and managing them. So when the teachers, I mean, the students already know today, like any issues with the Chromebook to come to the media center, that's really what they do at the high school too. And then Mrs. Tasker will be available like during lunches if they want to come here to lunch to learn something because they don't know exactly how to use slides yet. They can come here and she can help them during their lunch times. We don't really have set times for the lunch because we would rather just help them with whatever piece that they want instead of saying, okay, well, today's just got docs. If you have a form <coughs> question, you can't come. <laughs> so. Anyone have, no, any Anybody have any questions? Tammy. Are students going to be allowed to use Chromebooks at lunch? 
like when they're in the lunchroom lunch? We've told, we've, I've told them that there's not needed. So sometimes we do activities where we've had done like a Kahoot game for some fun at lunch and students have brought their own devices. So if we're doing those things, I said, we'll inform you ahead of time, but we don't want accidental spillage yeah. or anything like, so I said, please don't bring them to lunch or the bathrooms. Okay. <laughs> I, I personally am more concerned with the lack of social Lunch is probably one of their times in their day that they actually have to physically speak to someone across from them and Chromebooks take that opportunity away. And th that was a conversation I had with them today too when we were showing how to email home missing assignments and that's going to their counselor so that they can help them figure out strategies so that they're completing their work on time and letting the teacher know, you know, so the teacher can make sure that what they put have for an email is a correct email. Um, but that if they have a question to a friend that not to be using email just <laughs> go and talk to the to the person <laughs> It's a unique concept <laughs> Anyone else all right, thank you so much. Yeah, you're thank welcome. You. Thank, you. thank you. That's quite the endeavor mm -hmm. it's happening. Um, so, um, the next item in the agenda is a little bit about snow day learning plans. Um, and so, uh, we are, in your package you'll see essentially an overview um, of some information around what other districts are doing and, and are proposing to do during um, a snow day should school be canceled. And so we put the item on the agenda uh, this evening uh, just for discussion purposes and to get a sense of the committee's uh, thinking around this particular topic and, you know, perhaps where we should be exploring um, and going further with how to best utilize our, our time on learning. Tammy, would you like to... to sure. So I attended uh, the MASC conference um, uh, last month and um, the alternate structured learning day that's the technical name that they're calling it um, or blizzard bags um, was discussed and there are multiple um, districts that are using the blizzard bags as an alternate day um, and the reason I took interest in it for myself was the my concern that snow days that fall at the end of um, the school year tend to be in my experience not the best productive. use of educational time and maybe not as productive as they could be so I started to think about this um, to see if we could put something in place that would make those days valuable and so different districts do it in many different ways um, you know there are conversations about you know some districts do all Google platform projects or assignments. Um, I asked, you know, when we don't have school, we usually don't have power either. So mm -hmm. um, they tend to make the due dates, you know, after, uh, after a weekend following a snow day. Um, they have, most of the districts have worked out agreements with their unions. Uh, they don't do more than one in a row so if we had two snow days in a row one would not be a, a blizzard bag day the they vary on the assignments from elementary to middle to high school um, they my the big question that I asked um, that no one seemed to have a very clear answer and I actually went on Melrose is one of the districts that have done it and that's actually in our packet and I tried to find a video of their school committee meeting in which their they went back um, and forth school, and yeah. which their superintendent defended the question of what happens with special education service time. So, you know, in my experience, it would it would be fairly easy to make up for a half hour speech or a half hour OT session, but when you have students that have five or six hours of special ed, you know, usually your life skills classrooms or that. I don't know how you make that up and so that is that personally is my very big question and I haven't been able to get a clear answer so I just wanted to present it and, and you know sort of start talking about it the districts that have done it 
it's been over time where they've reached out to their parents, their teachers, you know, folks on school committee. It's not a quick decision, and I, you know, I want to say that I do absolutely value kids' time in front of teachers. Um, however, I'm not sure when you talk about a snow day that that value that I'm thinking about is there. So that's why I brought it up. Yeah, exams are done. Like high school stuff, you know, snow days, exams have already been taken. They're just getting the days in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have strong feelings, so I'm going to wait to hear. Was the only negative you found for the special ed? Well, I, I think that that was the big piece. I mean, I think the big the question, biggest, not negative, but the question. biggest, yeah. you know, negative is that you're not in front of a teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the the biggest negative. I think that was the one of the most glaring questions unanswered. Mm -hmm. unanswered. And I, but you know, teachers um, in one district were asked to do three b blizzard bags at a time. This create district, them in advance. This district had like nine snow days, by the way. Mm -hmm. So they, like, it was a necessity for those people. Mm -hmm. um, but the teachers, like, got overwhelmed with it all, trying to keep track. So there's different ways that you can do it. What about <coughs> holding accountability? Like, kids who don't do it? Kids who didn't do it uh, in one district, and I don't remember which, um, if they didn't do the assignment, they were marked absent for that day. Hmm. Hmm. But, but so the expectation is, or would be, or potentially could be, <laughs> that every teacher has created a, if you aren't in school on this day, here's how this day should be occupied. So if it's a high school, every class, I still have every class, and I still have assignments in every class, mm -hmm. and what is the expectation on the teacher? Because if the teacher's created that in advance, what's the expectation on the teacher during the snow day? So in some cases, the expectation was that teachers would be available for two hours during that day electronically to answer any questions <coughs> on the lessons that they pushed forward. Mm -hmm. In some districts, they felt that teachers having to correct whatever it is they gave made up for the time that they missed in the classroom. Um, for staff, paraprofessionals, wh whomever else, mm -hmm. um, custodians always come in anyway, but like paraprofessionals, many of the districts had a um, playlist of, of professional development and, this, and the support staff were required to do X amount of hours of the PD in order to make up for their time. Many, di many districts have a, uh, had made um, deals with the bus company so that if there was a blizzard bag day, it would not be charged for that day. You know, that's something you have to think about ahead of time. But so it, it ended up being a cost savings, but I'm not sure that you do this for that reason. But it was sort of a, a end of the a benefit that popped up. So I've got a couple things on my mind. One being um, for older students especially, there's a tacked on responsibility for snow days. It, doesn't mean you know you get the day off you shovel the driveway mm -hmm. or you use the snowblower you're not you know without responsibility for a day as well as like for younger students some of my favorite memories from my childhood are, are snow days, days mm -hmm. and not having to worry about having to turn something in because guess what I'm not in school I don't have responsibility and it's kind of like a time on life thing versus a, a time on learning you get to be out in the snow with your friends building igloos may um, I speak to that Jack so every district that's why they made it due only like the following week so that you could enjoy that moment, make up the time, mm, you know, which, but between that then, your hot cocos and all of that stuff. So That then brings me to the question, is it not just a glorified homework assignment right. to make up for a day in school, which right. homework right. can't. Yeah. Homework can't make up for a day in school, well, even if that if, day in school is less And if my productive. teacher is available two hours during the day that's a snow day, but not on the weekend. And that's not when I choose to be available, but nobody's doing it when, that day. What you, what's going on in the classroom that day either? Like yeah, you're comparing it to no, the I very last day that. of school or the last three days of school when everything's already been turned back in. So the glorified homework versus 
the glorified the, the day of school. The movie day. <laughs> but at least Which they're there. So you get both. <laughs> yeah. um, you get a snow day and you get a fun day of nothing to do at school. And I mean, it's sort of interesting that we're having this conversation after the summit platform conversation <laughs> because, I mean, when you think about Google Classroom and, and Jack, did they have that when you were? Oh, yeah. Okay. I wasn't, I wasn't sure, like, if you missed How it. How old are you? <laughs> but I, when I think of Google Classroom, if you do a flipped classroom lesson or you do some project-based learning, I think, I think you can find the, the, you absolutely can find the value there um, at the elementary level when you're handing them a packet of worksheets, the drill and kill method, maybe that's, you know, but, but I think that's where you put your time into this thought is what do those lessons look like? And, and there's a lot out there. I, I was like, as I was getting ready for this, I was like, oh, let me look at this a little more closely. But, I, you know, I think it's a long-term idea. It's mm -hmm. not something that's happening for February. Tomorrow, right. <laughs> and then one other thought I had about it came back to the discussion we had earlier about homework being assigned in the class. Because if it's something, I'm sure, what, well, it would be handed out like the day before you're expecting a snow day, and then if it doesn't happen, do you do the work, do you not do the work? If it does happen, it's kind of like you've been assigned something when you weren't there. It's part of their announcement. So on their district web page, a lot of them will say, this is a blizzard bag day. Check your Google Classroom or your email or, or something like that. So teachers are required to assign it that morning. Um, but in the, in the case where, so there was one district that does it. They do not have internet at all at their houses. Mm. Is this all Massachusetts? It is Massachusetts. But yeah, they don't no, even, so, not so everywhere. internet was not an option for any level. And so they always had a project-based thing that they gave at the beginning of the winter. You worked on it. Whatever you didn't finish was due like in May or something. It was like a long-term independent research project or stuff like that. So. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It was fun reading. Um, where would folks like to go with something? Does it need further study? Does it need a small group of people who want to propose an idea? Does it need, you know, clearly we are not in a position, or I don't feel we are in a position to, you know, make some decisions or to, you know, even say we're going to, to do it, it we need to explore it mm -hmm. if people have interest in that but would we need like the principals or like a teaching a group of teachers to be on that committee i don't know that we can make that decision other than say yeah it's a great idea <laughs> like if we agreed you know yeah if i may if, if, if the yeah. committee is interested in some level of exploration we could put uh, a group of uh, teachers and our you know pair professionals and leaders we could put a small group of folks on it to explore and study different options should the committee be that something they want to pursue mm -hmm. start with like a survey and something that simple yeah. see what the interest I, is I, you know I, I guess I you know would go in addition to the the group of, of staff folks but a group of, of parents yeah. as well I mean I have to say from a parent perspective if it's a snow day you're outside go freeze yourself mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I want to have to fight somebody to do work mm -hmm on the day they want to sit in their pajamas and drink hot chocolate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the other issues that it does solve is when you're doing family vacations on June 23rd because you were supposed to get on on the 20th <laughs> and then all of a sudden you have five snow days and you're now into your Florida trip so you're ditching your exams anyway. So that was another thing that, you know, it's, it, solved a pro it solved that problem. Well, the other, year, the other way is to build a longer school calendar that allows for certain number of snow days and then end or, and then end early if the, the end. Right. well we kind of start them. i think but it's not people don't go by it you, you look i mean guilty. No, but i'm I saying look at the last can, day and you, you know, can do think, it that way yeah mm -hmm. technically we can go to the 30th so mm -hmm. i mean there's a chance see i'd be interested in the committee to look at all of the options for dealing with <laughs> these really late school years right. i mean looking not only at blizzard bags vacation but weeks. vacation weeks mm -hmm. um length of the calendar starting earlier we starting start, earlier start yep. really if we could look at all the options because I mean I'll admit I'm not a fan of the blizzard bag um, I, I would worry that there would be kids falling through the cracks yeah mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and that's not what we want. Some of to those encourage. issues, though, like vacation weeks, those are contractual, aren't I they? Yeah, yeah. I think the, yeah. in, in so. Would, so would a blizzard bag would be, be though, too. because yeah. Yeah. because you would still have to, you know, essentially we. I would not like to see us create a thing that puts a burden on parents and students when they have a snow day and teachers have to do two hours of being online for two I mean that just that's not a good use of our district dollars right. mm -hmm. but to, the teachers you know, are also prepping they're prepping for that day but they're whatever that looks prepping like. for a lesson anyway or they're grading yeah. homework yeah. anyway mm -hmm. right you know whether they assign it because you're not there or they assign it because you're there they're doing that anyway so it's so it's all contractual I guess is what I'm yeah. trying to say and then the, the special ed students yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know that's big concern yes yeah. yeah so we could do we could look at all options and we could put a small group together that could essentially study this and that would be representative of families I think it would be important to that point to have a couple of kids yeah. on it too. students on it as well I agree students think I agree um, teachers you know paraprofessionals yep. leaders and we could you know work on something over the next you know few months Mm -hmm. And perhaps come back to the committee just with what we found. Yep. Depending on the with. outcome, you might put them in the hundred degree classroom. Give them all. Give them all. Give them all. All assignment on a February snow it's day, a sensory, and then put them in. sensory exploration. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that does that sound mm -hmm. a good plan? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll be happy to. Do we'll that. volunteer. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, so next we have an overview on our um, initial FY18 budget priorities. And so um, we will have the PowerPoint um, as a link in the video uh, and online. Unfortunately, we couldn't, it's it, uh, isn't pulling up. So um, we will make sure that it's available to the public at home uh, as soon as our meeting's done and it's cleaned up and posted. But you do have the PowerPoint <clears throat> in front of you. And I guess one of the things that I, I want to open with with this is that um, this evening's overview of our budget priorities are really about the what and the why. Uh, it's not so much uh, the dollars and cents and, and the numbers aren't even attached to this. Um, this does very much anchor to the other, the last item on uh, my report, which is the general uh, entry plan findings. And so my hope is that um, the committee and the public at home will see a connection between the budget priorities uh, and our district <laughs> improvement strategy and, and those four areas of our curriculum right which is the what the instruction which is the how the whole child and the uh, unifying of our of our two uh, towns and so um, this evening we have a bit of a foreshadowing of where we will be going on January January 9th which will be a full overview of our actual um, uh, FY20 budget. Um, and so uh, if you look on slide two, you'll see the budget process to date. Uh, and I'm you know, certainly not gonna read these items to you, but I think the big headline here is um, this concept of establishing a budget using a zero-based budgeting process, which means build it from the ground up based on the teaching and learning needs in your school. And so that was um, a, a big shift for our leadership team uh, and one um, that they were really excited about, uh, one that they really embraced. Um, and so there was uh, some front work done with the leadership team around, and all cost center managers for that matter, around how to build this budget based on the school improvement efforts that are needed and what do we want our schools to look and sound and feel like for our kids and our teachers. This was not about count paper clips, look for bids on paper. We didn't get into the weeds on that. We will manage that in the business office. Um, this was more so you design the school the way it needs to be built for kids and teachers and then tell us what you need to get there in terms of materials, resources, and staff. Um, and so uh, the other piece of that, um, which I think was very impactful, uh, at least for my, both Matt, um, Matt and myself, was meeting with each of the cost center managers to go through their budgets with them. So they all, um, cost center managers, principals, built their budgets with their staff and then had one-on-one -on -one meetings with Mr. Aaronworth and I to literally go through uh, what is uh, absolutely necessary, um, what are some I'd like to haves, and what are some, you know, some wish list items as it relates to their overall 
vision and mission of their work and their schools every day. Uh, and while it was incredibly time consuming, I think for everybody, um, it, it really did leave Mr. Aaronworth and I with a lot of information to just literally start coding and highlighting. I think we had 15, 20 pages of notes by the end of all of these cost center meetings, which then led to us being able to identify for the committee slides three and four, which are like the big takeaways. And I want to be, um, you know, really uh, kind of upfront with there's, there's a lot of other uh, materials and resources and needs that are not here. This is like the 30,000 foot view up of here's what we can, um, sorry, I'm still in like flight mode in my head clearly, um, <laughs> but here's what the committee can really expect to see in terms of patterns and trends in our FY20 budget. Um, and so, you know, my, my sense is the majority of what is here probably isn't a big surprise, right? And so we've been talking about curriculum development. We've been talking about building the instructional framework in our schools. We've been talking about the whole child and looking at the non-academic needs and we've been talking about kind of unifying the communities in town. So um, when we look at the materials and resources, um, you know, yes there are other there are other asks if you will in our in our um, uh, cost center uh, budgets, but these are the big ones, right? So we're looking at science materials K to 8. We're looking at establishing a curriculum uh, review and renewal line in our budget um, so that we have a process every year for curriculum development. Um, I will tell you at this point, uh, administration um, is uh, got their hand just kind of uh, somewhat involved in the science curriculum development. The teachers on that committee are just mind-blowing the work that they're doing, mm -hmm. um, along with our support from Teachers 21. Um, and so. Uh, one of the things that we are kind of smiling about is we, we get the process right. We've got it right. And so um, next we need to look at establishing that budget line every year so we are constantly reviewing and renewing um, a, another uh, content area. Next year we're doing math and ELA and we are going to incorporate the Johns Hopkins feedback we get from the district survey that will go out to teachers and from their visiting the classrooms in terms of seeing what um, materials and resources are being put in front of our kids and how our kids are applying their learning. Um, the other item that we're looking for is to really beef up our core literacy instruction. We know we're going to be reviewing literacy next year, but our kids don't have a year to wait for us to figure that out. They need the materials and resources. So we're looking to increase the level of libraries in the classrooms <coughs> so our kids have those just right texts during mm -hmm. Reader's Workshop. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking for Wilson training and additional resources for the interventions that are so much needed for our kids that are not at grade level. And look, let's be really frank. Sometimes people make this assumption that you have to have a student on an individual education plan and a special needs kid to get you know, that level of uh, instruction that is required to get at grade level, and that's not true. We have kids that, we have a lot of students that do not re you know, require uh, individualized ed education, special ed plan, but they need some targeted literacy instruction to get to grade level. Um, and so we need to have the resources and the teaching staff trained to be able to do that. Um, and then the last piece is really aligning our interventions across all schools. So what you will see here um, is it really kind of, again, like a headline, that 30,000 foot view up of Here's what we need for core resources for all kids, and here's what we need for intervention resources for some kids that need the additional support to get to that core. And if you're wondering about what about those accelerated learners, that work is embedded right into making sure we have the core science materials, literacy and math materials, and leveled libraries. That scaffolds up the other way too, so that if we've got, as uh, Donna mentioned earlier, part of some, if you've got that student that's reading above grade level, we have to have those resources for that kid too, so that they're not stuck reading at a level that's too low for them, that they're ready to really fly. So um, slide three is an overview of what those resources uh, would look like. Slide four uh, that we are uh, referring to as our strategic staffing, um, it really outlines the need for the additional FTEs that are going to be um, <coughs> place, we hope in place at, our, uh, at all of our schools across the district to really help implement the programs, the instructional programs that we need. And so um, I will talk through these just briefly for the folks at home so they understand uh, each of the positions on here because there are some of these that are new. Um, 
but the first item really looks at the four elementary classroom teachers that need to be restored uh, from last year. And again, uh, just a kudos to the committee and a thank you for when we did have the budget passed, restoring the positions we did. I know that that was a major priority uh, for the committee and for leadership as well, so thank you for that. Um, and we are asking to restore the rest, uh, I guess is the way to say that. Uh, with four elementary classroom teachers, one for AFM and one for JFK, so two for the complex and then two for, uh, for Millville. We're looking to restore the two classroom positions at the high school. Uh, what was eliminated was a English and a social studies position. Mm -hmm. um, they may not be English and social studies that is needed. We are actually working uh, side by side with the high school now on building their master schedule already for next year so that we know exactly what those content areas are. Um, but we, 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 are, uh, we are confident that we will need, a, we'll need those two positions back to help eliminate some of the uh, directed study halls that um, I think for any one of us would say is somewhat problematic to have at this point. Um, we are looking, um, and, and actually you'll see special education, um, it says uh, to be determined because as the committee is aware, um, we are doing an overhaul on the special education department as a whole. Um, and that, uh, the reorganization of that uh, and central office and a few other things will be coming January 9th with the actual presented budget because as you can imagine those things are like hand in glove. Um, and so um, that is being put on um, as essentially a placeholder till we really finish teasing out what that reorganization will look like for special ed. Right now we're about 75-80% of the way there. So it's still under construction but we'll be fully cooked for a uh, very rich conversation, we sh we'll say, at uh, the 9th of January. Um, we are asking for a high school uh, paraprofessional to help support duties. I understand the need for all of us to roll up our sleeves. Um, I remember as a principal, uh, when I had more hair, I did have to wear a hair net mm -hmm. and serve lunch a couple times, mm -hmm. right? So you all kind of roll up your sleeves and you get at it. I get that. Um, but I struggle with the idea that we pay teachers mm -hmm. Um, you know, a fair salary to do really good work and then we ask them to watch the bathroom every day. I kind of have a problem with that. I would rather them be working with their partner teachers, planning, looking at student work, and going through that process of, of developing lessons that the kids really need. So it isn't to say that duties would go away entirely, but if we can minimize that to a certain extent, that would be great to better utilize the teacher time. Um, probably the biggest lift uh, on this uh, on this particular piece of work is looking at the four planning, teaching, and learning coaches. Um, and so I want to just take a very brief moment to explain what those are. Um, these are, um, just like we have a basketball coach, you have a football coach, you have a coach for really anything, a fitness coach, uh, our teachers. A life coach. A life coach, that's right. Um, our teachers should have coaching too. And so these are other teachers that work within the unit A, within their bargaining units, a non-evaluative position to really work side by side with our teachers to do exactly what their title of that position is, which is planning, teaching, and learning. And so these are experts in the classroom. These folks don't want to be administrators. They don't want to, they don't want to deal with the level of work that, and the type of work that we have to deal with. They, these are your teachers that say, I'd love to go into administration, but I don't want to leave the classroom. Um, these are the people we want working side by side with our teachers to help them with planning, looking at student work, student data, and facilitating those learning plans for kids. Um, so we were going to be, we will be asking for, uh, again, this district of one, right, coming at this common approach, one for early childhood, pre-K to two, and um, one for grades three to five. And those two coaches would work across buildings. So we would align the instruction pre-K to two across the complex in Millville Elementary. It would get those teachers together on a routine basis, set a common set of expectations for what early childhood instruction and learning looks like in BMR. Um, similarly for grades three to five, it would align both uh, Millville and the complex. Um, and with that, this individual would help work side by side with our mixed grade level classroom teachers and help them design and develop lessons um, to the unique needs of kids in those uh, mixed grade classrooms. For the secondary level, we're looking to do something different. As you know, the uh, high school has eliminated their department heads. Um, and so um, at the elementary, uh, sorry, the middle school level, we never had that. We had team leaders that really just work on kind of coordinating the projects and assignments and field trips for their actual grade level team. 
um, but there is no content specific work being done. And so what we would look to do, again, this district of one and aligning our work is to have a six through 12 literacy and social studies coach and a six through 12 math and science <coughs> that would work in that vertical articulation of standards, skills, concepts, and expectations throughout both of the buildings to align the work that's being done at both the middle and high school. Uh, I will say that these four positions um, are incredibly important in really advancing our uh, district improvement work at the school level. You will notice, and I just want to highlight this for everybody, there is not one ask for an administrator in this plan. We are not asking for that. We are asking for teachers and classrooms and supports and buildings for teachers and kids. We are not asking uh, for anything that will not directly impact children in the classroom and teachers in the classroom. Um, and so with that, we are also looking for a middle school reading specialist. We have a lot of ground to make up at the middle school. We have children here that are not getting the supports they need to be reading on grade level. And I will tell you, my big concern is sending our middle school friends off to the high school not ready uh, from a literacy perspective. We do have some math intervention, um, but as you can see, we want to increase that by 0.5. We have a 0.5 math intervention. We want to make that a 1.0. Um, we are also looking to um, have a, a teacher just dedicated to the STEM work in middle, at the middle school, which is outside of our core science instruction. Um, as we're going through the curriculum development work in science, uh, we are seeing that there is a whole technology thread and engineering piece that we're just not getting to. And so we, we desperately need to um, make sure we are addressing deeply those standards there. Um, Moving forward from there, a help, de help desk, excuse me, technician. Um, that was on the, um, I believe in the budget last year as well. Right now, we have um, the integration specialist and we have two technicians. Um, and so this is really important because as we continue to increase uh, the use of technology as a teaching and learning tool, we wanna make sure we have the supports there that people need including parents, by the way, we to make sure the parents have access that they need to be able to monitor and support their children at home. Uh, we're looking to increase the nursing at the complex by, um, by half of a nurse. Right now we are at 1.5. Um, and then we are going to study whether or not it is fiscally uh, makes sense to have instead of just one building sub in each of the schools, two, instead of the day-to-day -day subs. So it's not necessarily new money. It would be more in alignment of the resources we have there. But we wanted to put it out there for the, for the um, committee to be aware of that as well. And so slides three and four are probably the most important in terms of um, what to expect. the what, right, and the why. So I, I hope it's clear that everything is anchored back to our district improvement strategy. Um, and slide five really just gets into next steps, which is our school committee meeting on January 9th. Um, we will have a full presentation of our uh, FY20 draft budget, uh, which Mr. Aaronworth is working feverishly on mm -hmm. uh, as we speak. Uh, we will have a reorganization presentation on key departments. Again, it's like hand and glove. These two things go together. Um, and <coughs> to be frank, once we are set after the 9th, we can schedule those um, budget workshops at the committee's pleasure, whenever you're ready to, whenever the committee would like to start holding those. I think on our timeline we said February, March, mm -hmm. but we'll be ready to roll those out once we have that initial, initial meeting. Um, and of course, we have our joint meeting on January 16th with the Board of Selectmen from both uh, Blackstone and Millville in our school. Mm -hmm. So let me pause there and See, see if there are any questions. questions or is, is FinCom from each town invited to the 16th? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. All right. That's what I thought. I, yeah, I may have said that incorrectly. I don't know if it's it was just the FinCom not written here, and you didn't say yeah. it, but I thought last time that yes. we, we invited them as well. So okay. this is really just the forecasting of. Yep. Any other thoughts, questions, things you want to see? Okay. Okay. And then the ninth, we'll get into the weeds of the numbers. Yeah. Which is where <coughs> we should come in our pajamas and stay yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the last item of my report um, 
um, is essentially an overview, an overview, pardon me, of uh, the entry work into the district. Uh, it is a very brief, just kind of two-page um, document that really captures um, a lot of the meetings and conversations uh, that I've had the pleasure of having with many different uh, individuals and groups of folks um, across our two towns and across our school district. And so, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about numbers, which are really important, um, but there is a whole other half of the story that needs to be told. Uh, and that's really from the, the perception of those that live in our two communities, that attend school, that are working in our schools. And so um, what essentially um, I did was put together an overview of feedback that we are getting directly from kids teachers and parents and so um, you will notice that um, for the student feedback uh, there are really kind of four or five guiding questions that we ask students at the elementary middle and high school level um, and you know it was just really great to sit and talk to our kids um, you know more than just kind of a hallway conversation but actually sit down with 10 students from the complex or 10 kids from um, Millville Elementary um, at Little Riley in kindergarten was absolutely hilarious uh, from Millville and her conversations with what I, I swear she's going to be president someday mm -hmm. with what she thinks needs to be changed already as a kindergartner. Um, she was just great. So, but having these conversations was just really impactful. And so, what I wanted to do was just kind of pull out some of the patterns and trends and what I heard from the kids. Um, and so, those are bulleted here. Um, on the back, uh, you will see again patterns and trends from teacher feedback and the guiding questions that were asked during that conversation. These questions probably look familiar to you. These mm -hmm. came right from my entry plan that I uh, had a chance to present in August. Um, and so you will see um, that other column really identifies, you know, teachers' voice and their thoughts. Um, and so if you look <coughs> at the teacher feedback, uh, in particular, you'll see those guiding questions um, our points of pride, what has allowed us to have the uh, results we have to date, um, barriers to our improvement work, and then what should be next. Um, and then lastly, the, the parent feedback. And that, that meeting was really helpful uh, because it really, I just did a lot of listening. I really didn't ask questions, the parents were asking me questions. Uh, and so what I did was I lifted uh, from that conversation some of the main topics that parents wanted to hear about. Um, and so um, we outlined those, uh, I outlined those questions um, here. And then lastly, where are we going with all of this? And so I'm in the process of writing a very formal, uh, comprehensive entry plan summary um, that will be very lengthy, but that will include all of this information. So it will include all of the numbers. Um, it will include all of the data points, uh, but it will also include all the conversations and the summary of those conversations um, with a set of like a so what now what. So where do we go from here? And so what I tried to do was outline at the bottom of this uh, overview of, of the conversation uh, data, if you will. Um, you know, this is how we got to this district improvement strategy. Uh, this is, you know, this isn't anything that I brought here with me from anywhere. This isn't anything that I made up before I came in. Um, this is what I've been hearing since, quite honestly, I interviewed a year ago, mm -hmm. thereabouts, you know, with the, with the district. Um, and so um, with each conversation, I have to say, um, it just solidified deeper. These are the four areas we have got to continue to work on. Um, it, it, you know, you can, you can label it something different, you can package it another way, but it really is these four areas, this curriculum development, instructional design, supporting the whole child, and unifying the two communities. It was said differently, it looked differently, it sounded differently, but it's all anchored back to these four areas. Uh, and so from there, we'll develop an, a theory of action. We'll develop a focused blueprint for district improvement. So we'll actually put actions and words and timelines and goals to all of those four areas. And then I would like to do something a little bit um, different, which is once all that is developed, create a promise to our community. And this is what the community can hold the school department to in terms of what we promise to do for our kids. And so um, just wanted to share that because that will share a little bit about, like, that's great. You keep talking about these data points and the century plan, fine, but where is this going? 
Well, it's going to be developed into a theory of action, a blueprint, and a promise. Uh, any questions? I don't go make a promise. Okay. Well, thank you. I, it's great work thus far, and I'm looking forward to reading the multi-page. <laughs> I will have a table of contents, so it, it, So far? No, yeah, well, 15, but we'll cap it in. We'll get it there, so it's concise. But it really, the idea is to create a snapshot so anybody could pick it up and see really our strengths and our opportunities and where do we go next. And where do we go? Yep, yep. exactly. Where do we go? Where do we go from here? Perfect. And that concludes my report, Ms. Ripley. Why, thank you. Matthew. Yes, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Um, so my reports are these charts, beginning. charts, charts, and more charts. Charts, charts, and more charts, which I know that everyone enjoys. <coughs> I'll go through them pretty quickly. Um, this month, uh, there's not a lot of strange activity, which is always nice to hear from a financial mm -hmm. report. <laughs> 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 like strange activity. <laughs> so, uh, with respect to the salary spend down, um, things are. Still, go, still going down. <laughs> There's nothing really that um, warrants any concern at this point. There was nothing that that looked out of the ordinary. In uh, my conversations with Dr. DeFalco, we and in analyzing the upcoming FY20 budgeting process, um, if you look at the back page, one of the red numbers that pops out is um, speech therapists and why we're spending so much money on speech therapists. It was brought to our attention, or it's come to our attention, that um, this is not just speech therapists. This is all of the therapists that are in the district, whether they be occupational therapists, uh, speech therapists, or some other services that are provided to special education students. And it's all lumped into this line that's speech therapists. Um, and that, that amount is driven by the needs that are listed in the students IEPs so some additional services um, sometimes need to be budgeted for but as you can see there's still even at the bottom line the there's still a balance we're watching that closely again making sure that we're not having too large of a balance toward the end of the year but um, if you if you look at substitutes and uh, some of the on the front page if you look at the substitutes and the I I apologize I was about to say the uh, the um, stipended positions but that's on the cost center review those are clearly costs that are still going to go up those number that number will come down Speaking of the cost center review, are, are there any questions on the salary spend down sheet before I move to the cost center review? Mm -hmm. It's not that much different. Than yeah, that. There, there's not any significant yeah. differences. <coughs> Similarly, the cost center review, all of the expenses have gone up. The encumbrances are coming down, and we are still showing a bottom line balance. Um, in a $254,000 range right now, but that's not to say that we won't continue to increase the encumbrances. Um, not all of the not all of the encumbrances are put in at the beginning of the year. Right. So some of the open purchase orders that we know about, they are put in, but um, obviously we come across new expenses as we move through the year. I just the I know that we addressed it in the past the instructional the classroom technology that says that we're on the fr first page that says $199,000 mm -hmm. above um, the, the that purchase years. order right yeah. that purchase order is get I think just got closed out yesterday so it wasn't done in time for the printing of this but by the next report that should be more level questions on the cost center mm -hmm. review question okay the revenue report 
by line. I'm not going to go through each one, <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, there was nothing, again, out, out, that stood out on the review. Um, our assessments have been coming in. Our Chapter 70 money has been coming in. We have been collecting money for, um, for our athletics and student services. You can see the pre-K tuition has been getting collected. We've been trying to do some follow-ups with parents that have been a little delayed with their payments. Um, so that's something that the business office has been following up on, making calls and outreaching families that either have been delayed or delinquent on pre-K payments and also lunch accounts. So we've been really trying to follow We have up. been following up on lunch? We have. Do yeah. we have a sense of where, so, Several years ago, we changed our lunch policy so that no student would be denied mm -hmm. a lunch. Yes. An appro you know, a, a yep. hot lunch, not yep. a cheese sandwich. Um, and so we had some significant balances, and we we tried tried to follow up on those. Are we do we still have significant balances? We still do know? have some significant balances. Mm -hmm. There are particular um, individuals that I think catch catch on and think that it's okay to just charge lunches for as much as they like. One of the conversations I had actually with the cafeteria is also some of the students that build balances, they're building the balances in the process of getting approved for free and reduced lunches. Right. Right. And because it sometimes takes a bit of time that we're not going to then go back and ask them to right. repay those balances right. when they really qualify for the free lunches. Right. Um, Linnea and I are going to be meeting tomorrow okay. uh, for one of our regular meetings and that will be a topic of our conversation on the process that we're following and, and how we're trying to close the gap. Okay. Great. So can we be reimbursed for the the charges? You can't you No, can't the proactive. state will only correct. The state will only reimburse for the number that are already approved. And so students have to, or families, have to apply each year? Correct. For, for this? Um, Correct. There is, there is a window of time at the beginning of the year where if they were approved in a previous year, their, their classification still holds, that you can count them. But if they haven't applied by a certain time, then that changes. Is it something that we can be proactive with knowing that, you know, these whatever family you know these families were approved last year and do we put some effort in getting those papers back mm -hmm. earlier so that the so that we're not accruing yeah <laughs> that's absolutely something that Linnea and, and I, don't I know can who look does at that but yep. you know, in my mind it yep. sounds good <laughs> but no. I mean I, I think it's just <clears throat> when, when we get that number at the end of the year all of a sudden we're like wow that's a big number mm -hmm. And so if we can we're gonna try to work through the course of this year to get that number okay. reduced okay. but I, I appreciate the the recommendation too and that's something that Lene and I can look at to make sure that we're getting those applications out into the hands the of people. the families that yeah. need them Anybody else? okay thank you the last report is a lot smaller than it was the <laughs> first time <laughs> we presented it as uh, the personnel update so as you can see, as of December 3rd, there were a few new positions that were, that were put into place. I'm not going to list them all, but you can just get a sense. <laughs> so that's also sometimes where you see the encumbrances on the salary spend down change. When people leave and when new uh, employees come in, that will change those encumbrance numbers based on sure. who's actively being employed. Okay. For a facilities report, uh, just a quick update on what has been going on. With respect to the longest moving project, our JFK windows and doors and boiler repair project, we are um, at the po point where they have submitted or are submitting for 60% completion for the schematic design. And I'm in the process of working with Unibank to secure funding so that we can start paying all of the all of the bills and I'm working with our project management company to work with MSBA to go into the propay system and start our reimbursement process for that so things are moving along smoothly Millville uh, 
wonderful thank you to the town of Millville who recently voted to approve the feasibility study on the boiler. Uh, so we've submitted all of the proper documentation to MSBA to take next steps with respect to that process. And as some of you heard uh, already, we just received today a notice for our core renovation project that we had put in for the high school. We requested that and we were not accepted into the program for the core renovation of the high school at this point. However, we were informed as, as always that we're welcome to apply for FY19. <laughs> and they even sent the application directions. And they sent the application. So if there are any questions, and as always, if there's any questions, um, the detailed finances were also shared with all the yes. school committee members. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a 200 page package, so uh, we didn't print it. I, I was looking to see if you <laughs> sticking, did, sticking with the <laughs> reduction of paper. Yeah, there you go. If anyone has any questions on any of these reports or any facilities related questions, please feel free to email me at any time. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions for <coughs> the facility? Okay. Anything else? Sorry, okay. I do. Just so facility, BMR, high school, do we have a list of things that need to be done even though we didn't get accepted? Is so one of ours? we have a subcommittee for that though, right? Is that something we should do? So actually, uh, one of the Fire processes panel. that I'm going through now is having, uh, I have been having energy audits. These companies are coming and doing a full assessment of the districts. Um, envelopes of the buildings, the mechanical systems, the boilers, the uh, HVAC systems that are in place. And my hope is to have a, a very detailed report put together for all of the mechanical and system needs for the district. Mm -hmm. um, the, speaking of the high school, the fire panel process is also underway. The company that, that we engaged to look at the panel has been working with the fire department to put together their specifications. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Any um, school committee members who have something they would like to share? Tammy? And, uh, you might have no, mine. The birthday girl. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, <coughs> say that the, the middle school girls, ba I feel like I'm just going to yeah. take your thing. So. No, I wasn't. You're good. Okay. Um, the middle school good. girls basketball yesterday um, and, the, and the middle school boys also um, celebrated a community family, the McEninnies. Um, Mr. Tim McEnany is um, battling cancer and all the kids kind of put together this fantastic um, day. They had all shirts made up and they um, just supported this family and it was, it was, I only got to be there for like literally five seconds but um, it was very touching and you know um, I just want to send our best wishes to the McEninnies during this difficult time. <coughs> Um, I was going to thank Wendy for her workshop on yeah. November 28th. I know I left maybe 15 minutes before it was done, so I was hoping that we asked her to come back <laughs> or, re or, or possibly um, are considering that for, you know, maybe an end cycle um, process. Um, but I wanted to thank her, and I, I thought maybe also anyone that didn't make it that night, if they wanted some one, on one time with Wendy, that she might be willing to do that too, yeah. so. And she did prepare packets, and I know you guys got, they got theirs, yeah. Um, and I just yeah. wanted to thank Dr. DeFalco for um, your communication up to this point. It is impeccable, and um, we can joke about how we're looking forward to reading mm -hmm. your, your pages of, um, Dissertation, you, but I say be careful what we wish for yeah. because we ask bring it. Yeah. <laughs> this is what we've been asking for, yeah. and it, it's yeah. it's you know whether it's 15 pages of of a summary or a 15 second video from you. I look forward to opening uh, whatever you have sent. So thank mm -hmm. you for keeping that communication and open. And if anyone in this community is feeling like they don't have information, you're it's all there. It's yeah. all in front of you. Our, uh, so. 
And we will at our January meeting um, have a discussion about how we all think that um, the superintendent is doing in his position and kind of his first um, assessment stage in, in that process that Wendy talked about. So we will do that on our January 9th meeting as well. We'll have our mid-year review. Yes, we will. Um, anyone else? Yep. I would, oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, I did want to just ask again about the mixed grade classrooms at Millville. Can we get a presentation perhaps at one of the next I meetings? did ask. I did ask. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. We had, um, when I did ask for that as well, and we had said perhaps when, once we have STAR, the first round of STAR data, so maybe not the January meeting, maybe the February meeting where we actually would have data to report. Okay. And then I also just wanted to shout out on the ice hockey, the co-op that we have with Bellingham. They were able to actually have a JV team this year with their um, number of kids. I think we have like eight or nine now from BMR that are playing, so it's going well. Varsity, they played their first game Saturday and had a tie, and they're playing their second game right now oh. in Natick. <laughs> and JV um, did lose their first two games, but it's a lot of eighth graders, but they're doing great. They're, um, great. you know, they're going to start somewhere. And we knew, do knew, we do have, I guess we haven't said this publicly, a yeah, new so. co-op women's ice, ice hockey, hockey team. Yep. Mm -hmm. cool. That's cool. So Very for cool. those who are excited about hockey as a women's sport, we have an opportunity, and I think that's, that's great. The more the better. Um, I would like to wish everyone uh, happy holidays, whatever it is that you celebrate, if you celebrate at this time of year. I hope that it is um, joyful. I hope that everybody has a nice break and can refresh and rejuvenate um, and prepare for snow days, whatever they might be. Uh, and um, to those who do celebrate, Merry Christmas. Our next meeting is scheduled for January 9th. Um, for those on the um, negotiation team, we do have a January 2nd um, meeting. And I think that's it. We don't have a need for executive. Um, not if we don't need to give an update on the negotiations. That was it. That oh. was side. As long as we're good there, we're fine. All right. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Just by Jack. Seconded by Tara. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Merry Christmas. Oh, oh, oh.